first is that agriculture in the 21st century must be different in many ways from the 20th century because of the many factual changes and trends. These are not matters of opinion, but factual elements. And these differences will make new approaches to rice production more economic, more necessary, more desirable, and more feasible. Second, I'm going to propose that more productive phenotypes can be achieved from most existing rice genotypes just by making certain modifications in the management of the rice plants, the soil, the water, and the nutrients. And we can make those changes right now and at lower cost. Third, that higher rice outputs can be attained by doing more to nurture the growth of plant roots and soil biota, as is done with agroecological approaches such as the system of rice intensification. So let me speak to these three points. Uh, first, I want to reinforce the idea in the 21st century agriculture, we cannot continue doing just more of the same. Our arable land is declining on a per capita basis. Our population is continuing to grow. Our land area is being lost to urban spread. And there's competition for land use and land degradation is increasing year by year. Our water supply for agriculture is reducing with competing demands for domestic use and for industry. And the amount and reliability of water are likely to diminish due to climate change. So the water part of our equation is changing. And pests and diseases are likely to increase with climate change. So our 21st century agriculture must respond to these different factors, relationships, and conditions. We're pretty sure that energy prices are going to be higher in the 21st century than they were in the 20th century. This means that production costs will be higher for fuel, for fertilizer, agrochemicals, and so forth. And the transportation costs are going to be greater. So the long distance transport of agricultural commodities will become more costly. Uh, secondly, the environmental impacts are of greater concern, as Pablo has already spoken to, I agreed entirely with his comments. Access to technology remains an issue, as many of the world's poor have been bypassed by the Green Revolution technologies, so we want to help them get something which they can use and benefit from. And food quality uh, is increasing in importance. When Ron Cantrell spoke to the World uh, Congress for International Year of Rice, he emphasized rice quality is going to be more important in the 21st century than the 20th. Unfortunately, the Green Revolution technologies that have benefited us in the previous decades are losing momentum. Uh, Prabhu was one of the first to call attention to that problem some years ago. A success in the Green Revolution was based on improving the genotypes of the varieties that we're working with and then increasing the input on the rice with grains in general. Uh, have been more or less steady or even stagnating since the mid-80s and total production since the mid-90s. Now we could produce more than that with higher prices. But that would then change the farmer's net income and it would be very bad for consumers and terrible for reducing poverty. So the price solution is not the one. We have to have a productivity solution so that we can get more food stuff for everyone but at a lower cost. Uh, so this suggests that it's time for us to start thinking about what I would characterize as post-modern agriculture, the next step beyond what we currently call modern agriculture. And I would suggest this will involve reducing agriculture's chemical intensity, uh, energy intensity and chemical dependence. We'll be responding to the consumer and environmental needs for healthier food production. And these changes will not happen quickly or completely, but I'm suggesting they should begin soon. And this postmodern agriculture, which would be very science-based, I suggest would be the most modern agriculture, building on what we can learn in microbiology, epigenetics, soil ecology, and so forth. So that's my first proposition. Second proposition is that better rice genotypes can be achieved with reductions in cost from practically all genotypes by changing the management of the plants, the soil, the water, and the nutrients. Our biotechnology is focused primarily on the E or the G factor in this equation, phenotype P equals interaction of G times E, genetic potential and environment. And agroecological approaches take any G and then focus on making improvements in the E so that they can capitalize on existing genetic potentials and that E is both above ground and below ground. This picture here from Cambodia, 
This is a woman farmer there who was previously getting two to three tons yield on this field. Uh, with these changes in management, was getting a 6.72 ton average. This is from a, a little plant that I was given uh, when visiting Eastern Java uh, about a year ago. Farmers brought this to show me what they could get with these methods. And this is a plant with 223 tillers. So I couldn't bring it back because of phytosanitary regulations, but I have seen it, I held it, and this is a picture of what can be done from a single seed of rice if you mobilize root growth and also soil biota. Next picture is from the rice research station in Iraq. We have several, uh, the director of this station is here today. And these are comparing new methods. On the left you have the SRI methods, on the right you have conventional methods in the same variety. You can see the difference in phenotype. This is possible uh, with this. Next picture was sent from Iran, from the Rice Research Institute at Humboldt. Again, they wanted me to show what they were seeing in terms of different size of roots and the color of roots. Because the white color means they're healthy and functioning, the black means they're dying. Next picture is from Afghanistan, where a report from the Aga Khan Foundation working up in Bagwan province. In 2008, they were able to get six farmers to try these methods, and they had an average of 10.1 tons versus 5.4 from the same farmers, same farms, but conventional methods at that time. The next year, they got 42 farmers to try these methods, average 9.3 versus 5.6. Six farmers had to drop off because of Taliban threats, but 42 just stick with it. These are their results. Uh, what's interesting is the second year SRI farmers averaged 13.3 whereas the first-year farmers had 8.7. So there's a real skill element here, plus building up soil fertility. This next picture, this is the, this is where they're growing rice, up in Bagan, about 1,700 meters elevation, short growing season. Um, next is a picture of a field at 30 days. They've had one single season, wide space, no flooding. And the next one shows you a plant at 72 days, with 133 fillers on it, and the farmers yield uh, was 11.56 tons per hectare. This is the difference in phenotype. It can be listed from the rice genome. Next picture is from Mali, where they've begun introducing SRI up in Timbuktu region. These are eight day seedlings that are ready to be transplanted. This is the transplanting process in Timbuktu. And then here's a farmer uh, showing up. On the left, you have about four conventionally grown plants in a clump. On the right again is a single plant. Uh, for our 60 farmers, the well, next slide shows they had an average of 9.1 tons versus 5.49, 5.49 from the same farmers, side by side fields. So the soil, the climate, the farmer are all the same. And then for the other neighboring farmers, they sample those of 4.86. You see a tremendous increase, and this is with less water which is a very important consideration up in Timbuktu. Now we'll go to more developed areas. This is research reported by the China National Rice Research Institute. Uh, they did two years of trials with hybrid rice, uh, in comparing what they call standard rice management, 30 day seasons, 20 by 20 spacing, flooding, 100% chemical fertilization, with a version of SRI, new rice management, 20 day seedlings, still too cold, but 20 is better than 30. 30 by 30 spacing, alternate wetting and drying, reducing water, and then 50-50 inorganic -50 organic fertilization with the same nutrient applications. And this is published in the Journal of Agricultural Biotechnology and Sustainable Development. Dr. Chung, many of you may know, I think he's here, Director General. Uh, Dr. Zhu Defeng is the Deputy Director General. This is the, sort of some of the best scientists in China doing these evaluations. And this shows the difference with taking spacing or, or plant density of the variable. First comparison, 150,000 plants per hectare, 180,000 plants, 210,000 plants per hectare. The yellow bars are standard rice management, conventional practices, older seedlings, closer spacing, flooding, all chemical fertilization. And you see if you add more plants, you do get some increase in yield, but not a lot. That indicates you wasting seeds, fertilizer, and water all these years. Anyway, the next one shows that we now have these methods demonstrated in 42 countries around the world, the most recently in Kenya, DPRK, Panama, and Haiti. Again, very diverse environments when the management can succeed. 
Okay, let me quickly go over the third point. Rice production can increase today and cost effectively by paying more attention to rice roots and soil by other. Uh, the Green Revolution, interesting enough, paid very little attention to these growth contributing factors. And we're starting now to understand better that we can have very beneficial effects to soil by other in the roots that we know, in the leaves, even seeds. This is a picture from Cuba where this farmer is holding two plants, a Vietnam variety, 2084, which they really love in Cuba. These plants were planted the same day in the same nursery. But the plant on the right was taken out in nine days. This is a tiny seedling. Planted singly, square pattern, organic matter in soil and soil aeration. At 52 days, our colleague visited uh, Luis Romero and he had a camera, fortunately, and he was just starting to transplant the conventional seedlings, because in Cuba, they transplanted in 50, 55 days, which was too old. And then they went to the SRI plot to pull one up at random. And here you see five tillers versus 42, but there must be something going on. It's not just the genome expressing its normal, pot normally expressed potential, but something else stimulated. We get some hints on this when we look at research from China, where they looked at the infiltration of rice roots by soil rhizobia, soil organisms, which migrated up the stems into the leaves, into what we call the phylosphere. Not the rhizosphere around the roots, but the phylosphere. And all five of the varieties that they tested compared to controls where there were no rhizobia that had migrated into the leaves, you got greater root volume, significantly greater, greater shoot dry weight, significantly greater, higher rates of photosynthesis, higher water utilization efficiency, higher area of fiber leaves, and you see a significant bump up in grain yield simply, and everything else controlled, simply because of the leaf infection of soil biota. Now this sort of comes, you know, good news to everyone, but it shows we're much more dependent on soil organisms than we ever had any imagination of. This last slide then is from work done in the U.S looking at what happens with the inoculation of rice seedlings by a fungus, Fusarium pulmorum. Most of the entomologists here say Fusarium are terrible and get rid of it. But it turns out that if you inoculate, sterilize the seeds, inoculate some with Fusarium, others not, and have them germinate, you get five times more root growth in these early stages, and the root hairs begin two days sooner because of the infection of the seeds by a fungus. Now this, I say, these are new directions you should be looking at very seriously. I'll summarize to say, uh, what's required to sustain the supply of rice for future generations? I won't say this is everything, but these are things which are not being attended to sufficiently now. We need to investigate and research more within the paradigm of agroecology, which I hope my friend Hans Heron will speak to. There are very large benefits to be attained by treating plants not as isolates, not as little machines but rather as living organisms living in conjunction and in mutual beneficial relations with organisms, just like all of you. I don't know if you all know, but 90% of the cells in your body are not your cells. There are 10 times as many microbes in your body as all the cells in your body. And if you didn't have them, you would not be living today. Anyway, agroecologic perspective looks at all organisms in associations with others rather than as isolates, which is the way our science is tended. Second, I think we need to pay more attention to management factors for plants and soil and water and nutrients rather than remain as preoccupied with G. I'm not saying we shouldn't do the work on G. Of course we should. We've made great progress. With these management methods, some are superior, higher varieties and hybrids give the best results with better management. No surprise. But we have paid very little attention to what are the possibilities of eliciting better phenotypes from existing genotypes. And then third, I think we need more focus on how to improve the contribution of plant roots and soil organisms, microbes, the bacteria, the fungi, the actinomycetes, the columbola, the springdales, the mites, of course, the earthworms. All of those are part of living soil systems. And I think we've paid too little attention to soil in its systemic quality, in its dynamic. We thought about the chemistry and maybe the physics and sometimes the biology. And I just added the last one, which one I think strongly. Research needs to be more with farmers, not just for farmers. I think there's a good sentiment here. I hope we can put that on the table.